Purple Heart Homes presents Putting the Pieces Back Together, a forum for veterans and the community to connect. Here are your hosts, veterans John Galena and Brad Borders. I tell you, today is a long-awaited uh, day for a returning guest. Yes. Our, is that our first return guest? This is our first return guest, uh, probably our, our best guest that we've had on best here guest at ever. all. Best yep. guest ever. Yep. And yep. so, uh, That's so awesome. such an interesting person that uh, we just had to have him back. To it's make show sure and tell could, day with the general. It is show and tell day <laughs> with the general. Yep. Oh. Well, welcome to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. You can find out more about us at phhusa.org. We uh, are in the business of helping veterans uh, overcome housing issues through safety and accessibility repairs, uh, solving homelessness issues, and um, we're really excited to be able to keep doing that each and every day. We've got over 1,030 projects completed now uh, over the course of our existence, and uh, we're really excited about that. And yeah, you can just go to the website, like I said, uh, phhusa.org, find out what's going on, how you can get involved. You know, uh, last time we had General Schwanick on, uh, it was just after the Army-Navy game in uh, 22, and uh, Navy, the dark side, had uh, had somehow overcome That was 21, the actually. That was 2021. Was it 2020? Yeah, it was. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's even longer. Navy, ago. yeah. Navy had won, and we were all in... Uh, uh, you know, a deep dark hole of depression. But uh, but now but now we have been victorious. Yes. And, the, and the army is on top and, and yes. reigning in, in the and place of right. All is right with the world. <laughs> uh, and the gen- I think I think the general being on our show brought brought good luck to the it, army. It, it, it did. It did. Yeah. yeah con- considering he's a West Point graduate, you know. So uh, yeah. I couldn't even. Uh, they wouldn't even let me apply for West Point. Was that even, bad? Yeah. The application just began with no. Yeah. <laughs> So just, yeah, I, I got the application. Just said no at the top and don't even apply. So uh, that's that is too hilarious. Had a good time at West Point, and uh, thank you both for uh, congratulations. First of all, on thousand and thirty projects. It's not bad. Thanks for what you do for our veteran community. It's just awesome what Purple Heart Homes does. Yeah, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. So General. let's uh, let's start for our, our listeners because I think when you uh, were on the show last time, we only had about eight or nine listeners, and so I think we're, we're up to we're eleven up, now. We're up to a few more than that. <laughs> we're, uh, look, it's actually eleven yeah. on Facebook this morning. So um, <laughs> tell us um, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to attend West Point and what that experience was like, and tell us a little bit about your your sports career. Well, I grew up right up the road in Winston Salem, North Carolina. Went to Old Town Elementary School. Wiley Junior High and um, R.J. Reynolds High School, and so I played. Uh, I was probably more of an athlete scholar. I played uh, on the 1960 North Carolina uh, champion little league team. I played a lot of golf. I was n- nicknamed the Blonde Bomber <laughs> uh, by Mary Garber, the Winston Salem Journal of Sentinel, and I played football. But anyway. Uh, I gotta tell you, I, I really didn't have an interest in going to West Point until I met uh, a person who worked with my father, who was a '52 graduate of the United States Military Academy. He got me interested in uh, attending. Said I needed to get good grades, and I was in my junior year. And guess what happened to me in my junior year at R.J. Reynolds High School? Mm, I was but... taking a course called Chemistry, mm. and I had this really just good-looking, just out of college chemistry teacher. Mm. And I paid attention to her more than I paid attention to the Wait a minute. So what kind of chemistry was this? They have a lot of chemistry going on there. So, you know, the periodic table and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I didn't, I didn't learn it. And so I got a C in chemistry, and I thought my chances of going to West Point were probably nil. But you know what? That little occasion caused me to learn to focus Mm. on what the subject is and Mm. apply my abilities to what the subject was and then I did make it get an appointment at West Point and lo and behold I was in advanced math I was in advanced physics I was in advanced engineering and oh by the way I was in advanced chemistry and ended up graduating (laughs) within the 10 10 percent of uh uh, of the top. Well, I tell you uh, what, let's keep a list of uh, recommendations from the general. And so starting today, uh, rule number one is pay attention to the chemistry, not the chemistry with the teacher. Right? <laughs> yes. And you'll go far in life. And you can go to West Point. I should have done that. I should have done well, that. I'm, I'm, 
I'm surprised if you guys made it through without making a few mistakes along the way. What? Along the way. I mean, that's what that's what education is all about. There were there were definitely a number of mistakes, not just a few, a <laughs> number <laughs> of mistakes. Along Man, the way. I know I know this. It was down to the wire for me at Statesville High School in 1983 when uh, Deborah Ellis, who's my algebra teacher, who loved me by the way. Wait, a minute, I'll say this again. She hated me. Uh, she loves me now. Uh, now, forty some years later. <laughs> <laughs> but um, she, uh, I had to pass uh, the last test to graduate from high school, not just to get a pass the class to actually graduate. There was some, there was a lot of uh, discussion in my household about what what my mom and dad were going to do with a kid who couldn't graduate from high school. Oh, so, uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> sir, I'm glad I'm glad to know that you excelled in life, and I started out in mediocrity and. I've continued to strive for mediocrity the rest of my days. So, uh, you know, Let me tell you a little story about one at West Point because I, I graduated high enough to choose any branch and choose, chose infantry, and this is when the Vietnam War was going on. I thought I'd have to go to Vietnam, and so I definitely wanted to uh, become an airborne ranger as an infantryman. And so I played basketball at West Point and had a knee operation in the – the commissioning physical you get before you go out uh, into the Army force as an officer, he told me, the doctor told me I should never go airborne. Now, the story here is pay attention to people that tell you you shouldn't do something. <laughs> but if it's in your heart, mm -hmm. you go out and make it happen. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I that's did. right. I went to airborne. I went to ranger school. Oh, by the way, I commanded the only airborne division in the United States Army. So mm -hmm. don't take no... As a as an answer, if you have it in your heart to go do it, you make it happen. So when you played basketball at at the military uh, at the, uh, at West Point, did you play for Bobby Knight? Bobby Knight was a head co head coach. Uh, Dave Bliss, who went to SMU, was the assistant coach, and he's the one that came and see me play at uh, R.J. Reynolds High School. Then Don DeVoe was the freshman coach, and I played um, freshman basketball one year. Four years of golf, and I was captain of the West Point golf team. But that's another story. Yeah. Did yeah. you uh, did you get have any interaction with with Bobby Knight? Did you see him throw any chairs across the basketball court or uh, anything like that? I didn't see him throw any chairs, but I did see him pound a metal wall over oh. at St. John's <laughs> University down in New York City into a pole. For he just started pounding it. And didn't give out very much uh, constructive guidance to the. Army team. <laughs> For those that don't know, Bobby Knight is a legendary basketball coach and was filmed one day when um, he got angry at a referee and threw a chair. He was coaching in Indiana at the time, threw a chair completely across the basketball court, and then the press conference afterwards, they asked him, "Why did you throw that chair?" And he said, "Well, I noticed." after they interchanged with the ref, that there was a woman sitting over, standing <laughs> over on the other side of the court, and she needed a chair, so I decided to throw it to her. <laughs> you know, uh, that brings us to our next subject of uh, leadership. <laughs> having all the right answers. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, General, tell us a little bit about your, your journey to become a general. And so you, you graduated from West Point. You're a, you're a young lieutenant. You, you selected your branch to be infantry. And, and tell us, what was it like to be a lieutenant during that time period? Well, uh, we all thought we were going to Vietnam, but uh, to understand that you had to serve in a unit, for, you had to go through your basic training, airborne and ranger training, which is about a year in length, and then you had to serve in a unit for a year before you could volunteer to go to Vietnam, and and then we were coming out of Vietnam. So my first assignment mm -hmm. was in Berlin, Germany. And this is still when the wall was up. I went there as a brand new second lieutenant. And I uh, reported to the battalion that I was going to be in. And you know what they had me do was my first job. I was given a platoon of about 44 men, tall like I am, six feet two or over. And I did the changeover ceremony at Spandau Allied Prison hmm. with the Russians. <laughs> so I was, I was across from the Russians basically said, stated on, on behalf of the President of the United States, I accept security for the security at Spandau Allied Prison. 
and the Russians gave it up to us, and they were all there with big old hands on their AK-47s strung across their chest. And so the only incarcerated individual that spanned out Allied prison was Rudolf Hess, who was chief of huh. staff under Hitler. Wow. wow. And so that was a pretty uh, interesting first assignment. Um, but then I, I was uh, in charge of a scout platoon that patrolled the Berlin Wall. We actually, under the four power agreement in Berlin, patrolled into East Berlin. So that was pretty exciting for me. Man. Um, but so did you say that Rudolf Hess was the only guy there at the that prison? Was the only guy at Spandau Island Prison. The whole prison was run and secured because of him, and he passed away in 1987. They tore the prison down. How about that? And he just lived there under under lock and key by himself with no other prisoners for years. That's right. Now, wow. He took two, consti two constitutionals a day, and he'd walk around the courtyard inside the prison walls, and actually, this is how he kept his brain functioning, because down in the basement, there was a dental chair, and he'd sit in the dental chair, and he'd read about the next place he was going to walk to. And it was a distance from the previous place he just had read about. Guess where he was walking to when I was down there? I don't know. The moon. Oh. No kidding. <laughs> studying the moon and taking the equivalent steps to walk all the way to the moon. And I guess that's how he kept his livelihood and why he lived so long. Wow. Wow. That is, uh, that's a crazy story. <laughs> yeah, there. he was not a nice guy at all. It, it must yeah. not have been to have had a yeah. whole prison to keep him as one prisoner secure. Yeah. Yeah, it just reminds me of when we had um, Ann Cohen on, you know. Oh, and, yeah. And, uh, you know, with her father in general, we had uh, a lady named Ann Cohen on back a few months ago, and her, her father um, served under Patton. Um, as a as a major and uh, was put in charge of one of the internment camps um, there in Germany and and then took uh, testimony uh, from the folks that were uh, liberated um, and developed what was called the Cohen Report, which was used at the Nuremberg trials to put guys like Hess away, you know, uh, or or worse, you know. So, yeah, he got uh, he got life in prison. Was not uh, hung. Yeah. Because uh, he tried to sue for peace uh, in England. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, just an amazing story there. So so you finish his first duty assignment, you, you move on, you um, eventually become a captain. Tell us about your, your time and some leadership experiences you learned as a captain. Well, I was a uh, company commander, S3 Air and company commander my first time in the 82nd Airborne Division. And I um, was jumping out of airplanes a lot. And uh, I'll never forget, I had a Staff Sergeant Gravy, who was my S3 Air NCO. And we started getting these steerable parachutes, MC1-1 Bravos. And you might know about these, Brad. But anyway, first time I ever jumped at MC1-1 Bravo, Staff Sergeant Gravy instructed me in what you do. And as you your chute opens, he said a big old platform will fold down in front of you with a steering wheel, and you steer it down to the ground. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not the case. You got two toggles that you pull to go a different direction. But anyway, that's the kind of fun I had with paratroopers. First were assignment you, with paratroopers. Were you shocked and when I, uh, when that thing and you know that thing got full of air and you looked down there wasn't a steering wheel? So. Yeah, I, I was wondering what the <laughs> <laughs> Where, Where's the steering wheel this guy was talking about? Wheel. I knew to look for the toggles, but I steered across the other side of Catfish Drop Zone, which was down by Camp Lejeune. And I went across the canal, and I had to hump my rucksack about, I mean, my parachute about a mile and a half to get around that canal <laughs> to a bridge and back to the turning points. So well, there's a lot of good out, a lot of good stories about so dudes uh, ending up in trees down at Fort Bragg and Camp McCall. But uh, I've seen it happen uh, on numerous occasions. Guys hanging you, up in a tree waiting it. on somebody to come get them. <laughs> Bring Bill's, a ladder. Bill's great character. Bill's great character. <laughs> just, uh, hey, how you doing? I'm just hanging around, you know. So, uh, hey, uh, we got about 30 seconds before we go to break. Uh, you're listening to Major General Retired Chuck Swanick and uh, talking about his life uh, uh, coming up through the ranks and how to become a general. And, and uh, uh, we'll be back here in a few minutes with more. And we're going to be back with Devil Dog Devin, who's back from a, a, a trip, to a secret trip to Georgia. Uh, and so uh, maybe we'll hear a little bit more about that here in a few minutes. So uh, right. stay tuned. We'll be right back. Mm-hmm. 
we'll yeah, take man. something. Well, so, uh, hey, General, we're, li- we're still going to stay live on Facebook. And uh, so there's another show that happens on the radio here um, that uh, Fred Lowry does. And Fred is, uh, uh, has a drugstore here in town, Lowry Drug. Uh, they deliver, by the way. And uh, when we got here this morning, on the table was a bottle of what's called Inferno Cider. Now, Brad, uh, let me just say, this this should be a lesson not to right? just drink what's left on it, the table that it, has the it word says, Inferno in the says, title. The, let's, let's, the let's, note let's, says. Let's check that out. Fred Lowry left this for uh, you guys to try. But So, so you just try anything that somebody yes, says somebody left for you? Even, you don't know that Fred actually left especially that. Especially if it came from Fred, I'm going to But you try don't know it. that Fred came in. Well, I'm going to trust him. So uh, Inferno Cider, and so here's what Brad, it's got it looks in it. like, like something that would come out. Ooh, go smell, in it. <laughs> smell it. Smell that. Yeah, I'm not smelling it. it. You told me you, uh, so here we are. We're going to do a live taste test what? on Facebook what here. What is it for? Um, what is it supposed to do? Got, oh, my gosh. It burns <laughs> smelling it's it. It's got apple cider vinegar. Uh it's got turmeric, rose hips, and habanero pepper. I'm afraid if you try that, you're not going to be able to finish the show without All running right, out like an I'm going, This is live on Facebook, oh me trying something I probably shouldn't try. Inferno cider. Hallelujah. <laughs> hey, that's not bad. Looking glass over there? Woo! <laughs> Boy, that's got a little bite to it. What, I'm not. I'm not letting it? a chaplain show Woo! me up. Why do you take it? That's my question. Why? Are, why it's are good you? for you because I mean, because somebody because somebody Fred said Lowry. Fred I know, but, I mean, left what, it for oh, us. What is okay. it for? What is it supposed to do for you? It's supposed to make. So you, wait a minute. It's supposed to make you chest. awesome. <laughs> is um, <laughs> we, we got to ask the general? Who? General, should I follow the chaplain? Do it, man. Come on. I mean, he he is a he is a major. Yeah. Go ahead. Do it. Have you ever been lost? Did you, did you take map reading classes? I did. Yeah, I did. I can find a grid square in yeah. a hurry. <laughs> That's scary. Here we go. Take, take it at the same time or, or, or go ahead, Devlin. You oh. want to see my reaction while I take it? All right. So, all right. First reaction taste. Mmm. <clears throat> oh gosh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you need um, a colon cleanse, try yeah. Inferno <laughs> cider. Yeah. <laughs> mm. oh. Yeah. Boy, it's I'll, good for uh, it's good for everything that ails you. Everything so that Inferno you. Cider, uh, go down to uh, Lowry Drug and get some of that and wake yourself up in the morning. You want to try some, Tammy? Uh, maybe later. Okay. I, I think I think we should have um, ten seconds. I think we should have Pete Barger leave us a oh, little yeah, sample. Yeah, that'd, check out. that'd get ugly. <laughs> that, that, that would be a lot better than five uh, seconds. Here we go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, you are back live with Brad Borders and John Galini here on Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes, and we are going to hear from Devil Dog Devin about Purple Heart Homes Project of the Week. Devlin McGregor. Be sure to stay tuned after uh, Devil Dog. We'll be getting back to Major General Retired Chuck Schwanick, learning more about his journey to becoming a general and his time in service and what he's doing now. Well, hello. Oh, good morning. <laughs> How y'all doing today? Yeah, he's brought his TikTok voice with him. Yeah, today. yeah, my TikTok <laughs> voice. I ain't done any TikToks in a while. You need to get I back got, on the TikTok. I got talk. one coming. I got, okay. I got, yeah, uh-huh. it's going to be interesting. You know, I'm not supposed to be here today. I know. Yeah, I'm supposed to be in Georgia. I saw you were on a uh, secret mission, right? Secret mission, man. Yeah, I was. And, and Tim Bates was supposed to fill in with me. And so he, he wrote. So wait, a, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> you were on a secret mission, but you come back early. Was that because the Marines got kicked out, or what happened there? You know. The Marines are just super successful in everything they do, and you and just it. like everything else the Marines do, I was successful in my mission, and you know I, I got to come home. I got it. Here's yeah. what it is: you, you guys <laughs> trained to standard and not to time. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Mission yeah. mission complete. We got it done early, so now we're back. So now we're going to send in some army for, for it, you know. It to, didn't to have anything to do <laughs> with Matt's wife Shay saying, uh, Matt, well. Matt, you got to come home now. <laughs> There might have been a few text messages <laughs> and phone calls. That's I'm not fact. a privilege that to is say. A fact. Um, I guarantee you that's what happened. But we love Shay. Uh, uh, so, so you want to hear the project Tim had lined up, or you want to hear about Georgia, or a little both? Let's Go, hear a little man. bit about both. That's a, yeah, doing right. both. So, so Tim's project. He sent me. I'm going to read this from an email. It says. Do you know where the initial Crayola factory is located? And I'm like. 
Yeah, yeah. It's located in eastern Pennsylvania. The first crayons from Crayola were made in 1903. And he said that to tell us about a project in uh, Tarrington, PA. And, and I'm not sure <laughs> if he was trying to say something about crayons and, and Marines since he was replacing me. <laughs> I bet he was. But, uh, I bet he anyway, was. Anyway. 100% chance. <laughs> there, there, <laughs> There's an Army veteran down there, Mr. Sneed, who is in desperate need of a roof, and we partnered with OC again, and um, and we're going to bring him a, a roof to Pennsylvania. It is nowhere near the Crayola factory, but okay. he deserves a roof nonetheless. <laughs> yes, nonetheless. Nonetheless. So. Are you going for a visit? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, special mission. That, that'll be next week's secret yeah. mission to the Crayola I'll factory. I'll see you on the counter and go, Devin needs the van to go to the Crayola factory. <laughs> hey, I, you know, I'm low on snacks, so uh, that's how it goes. Uh, but, but where I, I went yesterday was rural Georgia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we went down to Georgia, Matt Stevenson, and, um, and – we, uh, we, the reason we had to go down there is not every project turns out the way you hope it would. True. Right? So and we're often contracting with, with these contractors in areas where it's just you have to help the veteran where they are. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they aren't the best person for the job. And we had to go down there and, and things went awry and we checked it out. And I brought two contractors with me. And uh, we, we went out there, took a look at it. Veteran was happy. There. They had water that was, I mean, we're talking about orange, like, that, that was in their bathtub. It, the, if they come out, they look like they were. Rusty the, pipe. Yeah, no, no. It's uh, uh, water out coming out of the ground. from their ground, it's, their well. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. iron in their, in their well. Iron, aluminum, and mm. just uh, a lot of sediment. Um, if if mm. you took a bath in there, you'd look like you had bad spray tan. I mean, mm. it, was, it was terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we're going to get that fixed up for them. The veterans are, are happy now because the, the, they see that we, we are con- continuing mission, even though things didn't work out the first time. But you know what could have prevented that? is if we had some more boots on the ground. Um, and that that's the biggest thing. Sometimes what the problem is is that they don't – local contractors don't necessarily trust somebody that's many states away trying to uh, tell them, yeah, oh, sure, I'll pay you, um, because right. they've been burned before. So it just because you can't swing a hammer doesn't mean you can't help a veteran. So if you are interested in helping veterans, go to phhusa.org. Uh, also, if you want to donate, you can now text uh, PHH to 26989 uh, to donate. Uh, so so we've got multiple ways out there for you to help. Uh, please. So the number you text it's is 26989. You t- type that in, and then you in your... In your that, message, you type PHH. That's right. That's a phone number right there. Right? Now, uh, say okay. that again for me. I'm a little, uh, what, what was yeah. that number? 26989. You text that. You text that. And then you, you well, you, that's, that's the, the number, number you call. You you call. Yes. To, well, to, and in the body of the message, you, you put, put PHH. PHH. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make and sure. And if you're confused about that, <laughs> Just listen to us on uh, Spotify, iHeart, right, and, and, right. and rewind uh, wherever you're getting your podcast. Okay, there you go. <laughs> All right, well General. <laughs> we, we've got to move on. I can understand now why you went Army and not Marines. <laughs> I mean, just the, the, you know, the nature of who you got to lead has got to be different. <laughs> I don't know how the Navy's ever won a football game. I just don't understand, you know. Get brown leather ball, run that direction. That must be what they, they listen to. Thank you so much there, Devil Dog. We're uh, we're proud of I, you and thankful I to have you I did see a team. comedian online talking about why it, why does an Army beat everybody in the world in football? He said, you know, he's like, we beat the Germans in, in, with the Army. We be, we've beaten the Russians. We've beaten all these teams. And then we play Western Kentucky and get beat in, the, in, the, in football. Like, why, don't we, why don't we win every game, right? Yeah, uh, we're 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 practicing uh, shooting rifles and firing artillery, not throwing a ball around. No, that's true. Mm. That's yeah. true. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, General, we were talking about before we took our break. We were talking about your time as a captain and uh, some of the jumps that you had. Uh, so, my just a curious question: Did you spend all of your time in the 82nd from the time you uh, graduated? I the 82nd Airborne Division. I was there as a captain. I was there as the assistant division commander for operations at one star and then commanded 43rd command general. But when I was there at Fort Bragg, uh, as the commanding general, I was never at Fort Bragg. I was in Iraq because of 
participated in the fight north of Baghdad and out in the western Iraq. And we were talking about the Marines. The Marines replaced us out in the western part of Iraq. And on the 24th of March 2004, we turned over the whole western part of Iraq, uh, Al Ambar province, to the 1st Marine Division and personally Mad Dog Mattis. I'll be darned. Anyway. I love the Marine Corps because they came in and replaced us. That's right. Hoorah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that was, a, that was a really tough time in, uh, in, in our campaign there in Iraq as a whole. You know, and I think some of those transitions uh, were, were times of test and, and for the enemy to figure out what the new incoming unit was going to be like. And, you know, I think they quickly found out the Marines weren't playing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it was a... It, it, it didn't change to a softer unit, right? Mm-hmm. But just no, tell us did. tell us a little bit about your time there in Iraq, and uh, tell us about some of the the lessons learned, and and from a leadership perspective, you know, maybe how some of your leadership philosophy evolved, uh, being a general leading troops in combat. Well, I'll tell you for about the first, I'd say, sixteen, seventeen years of my military service in various units. It was all about trying to figure out leadership. And, you know, as a captain, you're a leader. Uh, as a major, you're a staff officer or an executive officer. But then when you command a battalion, you have to kind of pull together what your command philosophy is. And I think that's when I really put together my leadership style. It was always about people first, mission always. In other words, I had respect and admiration for the people who were serving under me and that I would do anything for them. And I, I expected because of that, they would do the mission, ensure the mission was done to uh, standards of excellence. And so, you know, in my whole philosophy about the time I, I spent in the military, you asked me about how I became a general, I think, you know, it codified right there of what was important to me. And by the way, I think at the battalion level, of any level of any organization in the United States Army, I think the battalion level is the focus. That's where all the work of the Army's done at battalion level. That's closest to the troops, and it's also closest to setting the priorities and the guidance and resourcing those troops. Now, go ahead and warp speed ahead to being a brigade commander or being a general officer, I believe brigade commanders and general officers are all responsible for keeping all the distractions from above away Mm -hmm. from those battalions so they can get the work of the Army done. So I guess if you look, battalions are the centric portion in the military, in my opinion, and everybody above them is in a position to shield from distractions and resource the work of a battalion. And so that's kind of what I, I felt like as a, as a colonel and then as a, a general officer that my, mind, my primary function was to ensure the units at battalion level were successful in what they did and then I'd be successful mm-hmm. as, a, uh, as a leader. Over there. People are intimidated by general officers. They right? are. I mean, you know, you see the star and the flag and the entourage. And I remember um, I was a I was a newly minted lieutenant uh, on a on a run at Fort Jackson. It was a battalion chaplain down there, and I uh, and I was older. I was I was close to forty years old when I when I came in the army, and so I'm running up Tank Hill the, there at Fort Jackson, and I noticed a. Uh, a small group of folks running towards me um, with all these vests on, and it's just as I pass them, and I'm running up the hill, I noticed there was a, a big general thing on this guy's vest. We had these running vests, right, and it said general on it, and, and I ran past us like, oh, please don't talk to me, please don't talk to me, and then I heard this, hey, lieutenant, <laughs> right? And I turned around, and it was Brigadier General James uh, Schwitters, uh, who had just been called out of retirement to take over the uh, command, uh, the garrison command at Fort Jackson. He had been one of the first commanders of Delta Force back in the day. And uh, I didn't know this at the time. And then he said, um, he, how old are you? <laughs> That's his first question to me. And I was like, sir, I'm 39 years old. He said, I have never seen a 39-year-old lieutenant. 
You're the oldest lieutenant I've ever seen. <laughs> I'm like, well, sir. He's like, why are you, why are you so old, right? What's your problem, right? How did yeah. you become yeah. so yeah. old? And how long have yeah. you been a lieutenant? Yeah. And I was like, well, sir. I, you know, 9/11 happened. And I joined the army, and I'm a chaplain now. And he's like, well, that's pretty amazing. He said. I'm going to make sure you get promoted to captain because <laughs> you're too old to be a lieutenant. And uh, anyhow, a year and a half went by, and I finally got captain promotion orders. And uh, and he showed up. Uh, he Somehow he found out that I was getting promoted, and he showed up and slapped my chest, uh, uh, putting my new rank on me. So, uh, But I'll never forget that because I was intimidated for sure. And yeah, I was they old. They are. So. They are. So, General, tell us, uh, at what point, I mean, in Talk about the goal setting. You know, you you come out of West Point, this uh, this amazing uh, university, and and you you go into the military, and you're you're a lieutenant. And at what point did you kind of start setting goals and having ambition to move up the ranks? And and at what point did you decide you wanted to make it a, a lifelong career? Well, I think it was uh, primarily I enjoyed one, what I was doing, and I was doing it with a bunch of great Americans uh, leading them, Mm -hmm. and all I focused on is whatever task I was given at whatever level it was to ensure I I accomplished that task with the team to, uh, you know, standards of excellence. And the consistency of doing that over time, I guess you get promoted because of that, and that's why I think I got promoted. And even... When it came to the point where I was a senior, when I was a colonel, the brigade I commanded out in Hawaii went all the way to Haiti um, to keep Aristide alive and to keep the populace uh, in uh, Haiti um, kind of vibrant. It would never be a vibrant place, but we tried to do that. But accomplishing those tasks um, to standards of excellence normally helps get you promoted to the next rank. And... You know, you can't really set that as a goal to become a general officer because 1% of, yeah. you know, the, the Army becomes a general general officer. And so you can't put it on yourself because a group of uh, general officers in Washington, D.C. decide who's good enough to be a general, who's not good enough to be a general when they revert, review the files. And so you got, you got to just keep on doing your job, and if they select you, so be it. If they don't select you... It's not anything you did. It's just they didn't know you. It's you. Mm-hmm. The people on that board have to know who you are, have served with you, and that's how you get picked to be a general mm-hmm. officer. So that's a pretty interesting way of approaching life. Can't – well, I'm not sure if that's how some of the general officers approach life. That's how I approach it. <laughs> now, we got a couple oh. minutes before the break, and, and I'm interested to hear what is it like, um, like experientially going from, you know, like – 06 and 07 are, are just one number apart, but that, like life changes in a dramatic way when you go from being a Fulbright colonel to a general, and if you could explain kind of what the differences are. Well, I'll tell you, the biggest difference is as a colonel, you can probably stay somewhere for two to three years. As a general officer, once you become what's called a generalist, you've got to be able to do anything the Army throws on your plate. You start getting moved around pretty quickly, and that's mm-hmm. probably the most uncomfortable part of being a general officer is about every 11 to 12 months you're going to be moved Mm -hmm. you got to pick up your family you got to pick up all your goods you got to move to a new post Mm -hmm. to do something that the army needs you for and let me tell you it's at the discretion of the chief of staff of the army what they want you to do and so you just got to say yes sir yes sir three bags full and move on yeah right probably uh probably the most uncomfortable part of being a general officer. Wow. I was lucky to command the 82nd Airborne Division for two years. It's a command position. I was lucky to command Fort Polk, Louisiana, the Joint Readiness Training Center, for just under two years. But other than that, it was moving every yeah. every couple months. Yeah. It seemed like. Well, you are listening to putting, back, putting the Pieces Back Together with Brad Borders and John Galena, and we are here with our special guest, retired Major General Chuck Schwanick, and we will be right back after a short break to hear more about General Swanick's time in service and the work that he's doing now to serve our veterans, military, and their family.
I got an I got another good general officer story for our Facebook time. So <laughs> when when I when I got out of my basic course or was getting ready to get out of it, they brought all of the they brought all our wives in for a for a uh, like a how to be an officer's wife class, right? And so that's she a, had to I get, didn't know that's a yeah, thing. they yeah, it's so it's sort of this indoctrination, and they taught them they taught them all the all the ranks and and you know what the rank structure looks like and everything. And anyhow, there was one of the and Tammy tells the story better than I do, but there was a woman in the uh, in her class that had gone to the PX and. At the PX on every post, there's like designated parking for, um, you know, like chief warrant officer, or command sergeant major, yeah, yeah, or there. Purple Heart awardee, right? And then also there's general officer parking, right? And so this woman parked in the general officer parking space, right? And then got out and went into the PX and came out. And then someone obviously was like, hey, um, saw her coming out and getting in her car like hey you're why are you parked in the general officer parking space she said well my husband's an officer generally <laughs> uh, oh gosh right and so she just thought it was like any officer right generally that's your that's your that's your parking space right? i mean <laughs> didn't realize you had to have like a star on your yeah. uniform so anyhow. i mean she wasn't incorrect that's that's semantics she was, really it's a, uh, <laughs> yeah right 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 yeah. so uh, that was, that was pretty cool so yeah tammy had to go through this uh this in doc class that um after it was over, we we were driving back home after graduation, and I was like, "Hey, how did that class go?" Uh, it w- I never want to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so, so General Schwanick, it, it's my understanding that there's like a kind of like a finished school that generals go to. Is that is that right? I don't know if he can hear me. Did, yeah, he he might. Yeah, we might we might have lost him for a second here. Um, so, yeah, Rob uh, Moore, Christina Moore, General Moore's husband, is getting ready to go to a uh, school uh, the same with um, <laughs> with General Moore as uh, she goes to her finish so school. So Rob gets to go to the finishing school himself, how to be the husband of a general. How to be the husband of a general, oh, uh, which is going to be really interesting for a uh, combat engineer to uh, <laughs> have a little <laughs> finesse. You know? I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work. If I know Rob, he'll go, she's been a general for 30 years Ten in seconds. my house. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Hey, welcome back to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. You can find out more about us at phhusa.org and how we help veterans each and every day. Yeah, it is uh, great to be here today with retired Major General Chuck Schwanick, learning about his time in service, uh, leading the 82nd Airborne and uh, all the different stations that uh, he was posted at and commanded and learning about his leadership style, leadership philosophy, and some of the lessons learned and how they now apply to the work that he does uh, supporting our military, supporting our veterans, and the families of veterans today. So, General Schwanick, thank you for joining us today, our first uh, return uh, guest, and certainly we're proud to have you with us. Glad to be with you here today, and uh, it's just great to be with PHH and uh, taking care of veterans the way you do and that's that's what I kind of enjoyed doing you know after I took off my uniform but every change of command that I had along the way I'd always tell the soldiers that were serving under me that I'll be I'll, I'll be glad to do anything I can to help them in the future yeah. and so I, I've written a bunch of uh, in, in that regard a bunch of letters of recommendation for them who have uh, approached me to do that it's one thing I could always help them along their way, and, and that's what I tried to do. Well, I also know that uh, at Veterans Day this year, uh, you do a thing every year uh, down in Charlotte, uh, Veterans Day celebration, and, and I was uh, fortunate enough to have attended that this year, and we had uh, a Medal of Honor recipient uh, uh, speak, and it was it was, uh, it was a really powerful, powerful time, and, and there was a lot of veterans gathered in that room, so uh 
appreciate what you do uh, honoring those folks at Veterans Day for sure. Well, we uh, we were very fortunate this past year to have uh, Lance Corporal Kyle Carpenter who served in the Marine Corps and was awarded the Medal of Honor, Honor for um, jumping on a grenade to save and protect his buddies uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, that kind of culture is what the, the organization I'm with right now that I work for, Speedway Motorsports, in taking care of our veterans. And actually, uh, we, we've had two of those with two Medal of Honor recipients the year before, Joe Marmon. So it's interesting to hear their stories, but more importantly, it's, it's to learn from them and understand how they value the American life and how they value other people on their team. And it's all about teamwork and doing what's right for our country. Yeah, the one thing I noticed about Kyle, he's just incredibly humble um, and uh, a very warm. Um, and and uh, I just noticed uh, just watching him interact with people that just – you know, people want to come up and, and shake your hand when you when you you know when you're a Medal of Honor recipient. And uh, but I just noticed he was very um, in tune with everybody he was talking to. It didn't look like anything. This wasn't a bother for him. Um, that he was genuinely interested in every single question that he got. Uh, every person thanking him. And uh, but uh, what a what a wonderful human being. So uh, I was really honored to be able to meet him. So thanks for setting that up, sir. Glad you could join us. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the other work that uh, happens there at Charlotte Motor Speedway and, and the speedway, uh, you know, speedways that are owned all around the country by uh, the, the Bruton Smith family. And and you, you mentioned just the patriotism that they have and what they support. Tell us a little bit about that and some of the work you do. Well, uh, Speedway Motorsports, uh, Marcus Smith, the current CEO, came to me in 2019. He says, Chuck, um, we've got too many veteran suicides. Their divorce rates higher percentage-wise than their civilian counterparts, and we still got a bunch of them homeless. Let's figure out a program that we can use to kind of show them we love them and we want to help them. And so, I developed a program called Welcome Home Patriots, mm-hmm. and basically, it's I engage the um, defense companies around the United States that. Are a lot of them led by West Point graduates and academy graduates. A lot of them with uh, military leaders in it that I served with along the way. And so I approached them and asked them to sponsor our veterans and their families to NASCAR races. Now, why, why does a veteran want to come to a NASCAR race? First of all, about one-third of the fans in NASCAR have some association with veterans. Either they served or they had, you know, their father, grandfather served. Um, secondarily... Uh, it's very patriotic. Uh, it's probably the most patriotic sport we got. It's always got an adrenaline rush when the green flag goes down, and if you jump out of airplanes, you get an adrenaline rush. You mm-hmm. low crawl under machine gun fire, you get an adrenaline rush. Mm-hmm. You land even on an aircraft carrier, you get an adrenaline rush. And so they associate with that adrenaline rush when that driver gets that car going across the start-finish line, you know, at about 180, 190 miles an hour, mm-hmm. putting their life on the and then the third thing about it, just like we talked about Army-Navy rivalry, well, Company A is always rival to Company B in, in any unit you go to. Yeah. And there's that common rivalry in our motorsports industry between drivers. Like, uh, you know, Chase Elliott's got a feud probably still with uh, – well, I know a lot of them got a feud with Ross Chastain right now. So <laughs> if you're a fan of Ross Chastain or a fan of one of the other drivers, you've got kind of a rivalry there. And so – Defense companies will sponsor. I've got uh, four scheduled for this year, about uh, somewhere between 400 and 600 veterans and families going to NASCAR races um, that sponsor uh, VIP credentials for them, and go to a suite, and um, we give them swag, and they get to partake as a family of a great, uh, a unique experience at a, at a race. Yeah. And so I've got one in Las Vegas on March 5th. i got one here at Charlotte Motor Speedway. On uh, May 28th, I've got one at the uh, Atlanta Motor Speedway night race on July 9th, and I've got one at Bristol Motor Speedway for the night race on September 19th. And I'll have 100 veterans and their families sponsored That's awesome. by KBR Incorporated at each one of those races. That is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. And so if there's a veteran out there listening that's near any of those uh, tracks, how might they uh, be able to – have that experience how do they get involved in that 
Well, um, just an example, like here at Charlotte, I'll be getting people active duty from Fort Bragg, North Carolina, from Seymour Johnson. I'll get uh, veterans from here in Charlotte area. And I basically, I, I go about that by going um, through the coffee shops, um, the coffees that they have for veterans, or you can find me on the web and, and send me that uh, you want to partake in one of these, and I'll try to get KBR to sponsor you. Mm. Yeah, so KBR so. is the is the one that decides on who is. I also do the North Carolina National Guard, both Air and, and Army Guard. So that's another way that you can can get involved with this. So if you're a veteran and you're interested in getting involved, go to some of the coffee shops. I know Don Timmons puts them on uh, all around uh, North Carolina, and uh, you can find Richard's out where those are at. Up in Forestville. Yeah, yep. Richard's Coffee Shop. Go uh, go join some of those groups. Great camaraderie, and you learn all about different types of events, uh, just like General Swanick. Richard, and, Childers, uh, uh, Richard Childers puts on a big uh, coffee for breakfast uh, I don't know. Is it once a month or once uh, a quarter or something? Like once a second, month. Second Wednesday of every month. It's every month. This year will be in, in, in February. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's hundreds of veterans that come out to yeah. that. So we got a lot of great Americans that are uh, uh, wanting to take care of those who served, and uh, it's really cool to be connected with them. So Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. Three pillars of welcome old patriots. Just let me tell you real quick. Salute is that we show them we love them. Engage. The reason we engage, I bring motorsports leaders and drivers up to talk to the veterans, but also local dignitaries, because with just less than 1% serving in our military right now, there's a huge gap between understanding the civilian community and our military community. And the third pillar is in, enable them, try to help them with any mortgage, uh, better mortgages they can have, insurance they can have, uh, connect them with veterans organizations that come up and speak to them. So it's a... It's salute, and engage, and enable as the three pillars that we try to follow through with. Salute, engage, and enable. I tell you, that's okay. uh, that's great, great foundation for any organization that wants to uh, take care of veterans, support our military. Uh, you can't go wrong with that. You're listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together, presented by Purple Heart Homes. Here with us today is Major General Retired Chuck Schwanick, Commander, 43rd Commander of the 82nd Airborne Division. And uh, if you missed any part of today's uh, show you can listen to us on spotify or iheart podcast wherever you get your podcast yeah driving up listeners yeah Man, absolutely you can punish yourself later <laughs> <laughs> could be push-ups so um general let's just uh, another curious question for you here um what changed in you know we talked about you know your your positions as a leader a, a young lieutenant uh, your your time as a, a battalion commander and then as a general officer, but what was a, a change that took place in between those three uh, particular stages of your leadership? What what was something that you look back on now and identify as a change? And and I, I can certainly say that uh, as you spoke about your philosophy and leadership and taking care of people. Uh, I see that in you still today, and in, in all my years of interacting with you, I, I can see the genuine uh, concern that you have for people, and, and so appreciate that. And but, what what's something that changed in in your leadership style from point A to point B? Well, I, th I think the, the most important thing that changed um, in our army is coming out of Vietnam, where we went from a draft army. To a volunteer army, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we had decimated the non-commissioned officer corps during Vietnam, and we rebuilt and actually started schooling our non-commissioned officers in their uh, duties, and they have become the best non-commissioned officer corps in the world. And then, right at the same time, we started identifying task conditions and standards for mm -hmm. every task we did in the army. So. What that really did is it brought in, I think, a better quality, the whole quality of people, a better backbone for our Army, and then it really helped you figure out what was important to do, what was less important to do to the task condition and standards and establish your mission essential task list. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you that's the most important thing our Army did to develop into a very good army, which was a Vietnam army, to a, the best army or best military in the world, in my opinion, that we have right now. Yeah, and, and I have seen the the uh, benefits of that 
uh, and the senior NCO leaders that I know currently that are still serving that are as educated and as um, uh, and, and as far as leadership development could could lead any anybody anywhere anytime um, and um, which which makes a lot of sense from have instead of having a um, command and control type uh, uh, leadership principle that it, to a more organic type of leadership where leadership is pushed down from you know with commander's intent down to the lowest level and that those uh, you know those NCOs on the ground can execute the task um, without having to be told exactly what to do every step of the way they already know how to do it and then uh, this new philosophy that has been developed over the last 30 40 years uh, enables them to do that without the leader getting in the way right well and I think it goes let me just share, let me just share one more quick thought with you and um, and you know a lot of people out there might think a general officer has a staff and he sits in division headquarters or he sits in the tactical operations center no that's right if you if you respect and love the people that are serving under you you go out and visit them and that's mm-hmm. exactly what I did when I commanded forces in Panama when I commanded forces in Bosnia when I commanded forces in uh, Iraq. I would fly out. I'd leave ever the, the headquarters after getting a briefing at 9 o'clock in the morning, fly out to various locations to visit those battalions and companies out there doing the patrolling and the security operations and stability operations. And then I'd come back around 5 o'clock in the evening to get a briefing. And uh, But I'd spent the whole time out there finding out what was going on with the heartbeat of our Army the battalions and companies that I spoke of earlier. And that's what a general officer is supposed to do, not be in his imperial palace. He's supposed to be out there with the people yeah. he loves and find out what's going on with them so he can do the best he can to support them. Mm-hmm. Well, General, that is that is fantastic. And we've, you know, over the years had so many great conversations about about uh, how you interact with people. And would you just share with the listeners um, how they can better their interaction and support of veterans uh, out in the community? How can how can they take that same philosophy uh, of being a general into supporting veterans? Well, I think it goes down to, uh, I think our, our civilian community loves our veterans. They just don't know how to interact with them. So if you see Chuck Swanock walking down the street with an airborne hat on his head, you know, you might want to say, hey, what's that hat have on its head? Are you airborne? Hmm. It's a little bit more intimate than just saying thanks for your service, which is respectful. But you see how the intimacy between the veteran and the civilian needs to get to a higher level, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So ask them when they served, what unit they served with, what was their duty that they had in the military. And so I think to take it to another level is thank you for your service is kind of like getting my pleasure at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> well, you appreciate it. It sounds well, canned sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but you, you yeah. take it to another level that you're really interested in the person by asking them these questions. So I think that's prob- probably will help our, our relationship between our civilian community, our military veteran community very much by just – trying to take it that next step. That's awesome. Well, General, we can't thank you enough for being on the show with us again today. You're welcome back anytime, and we could have you on every week because you bring new stories each and every time. And, and, and new, really appreciate new lessons it. for life, too. Yeah, new lessons for life, yeah. I'm a better human being having to be, sit in the presence of the general today. So yep. uh, that's pretty and, awesome. my, and my health is going to be a little better, too, after some Inferno <laughs> That's cider. right. That's right. I'm going to take that bottle home with me. So, uh, hey, uh, next week we're going to have a really interesting show with uh, Paul Veach is going to be on. We're going to talk about uh, reboot uh, recovery. Uh, trauma recovery, but we're also going to talk about volunteering. And I'll um, be zooming in from a secret, undisclosed location <laughs> oh, on the mission so on the other side of the world. Forward to that. So uh, anyhow, I uh, hope to see you all next week. Have a have a great week this week. Uh, we'll see you next time on yeah. Putting the Pieces Back Together. Thanks for your service, General. You've been listening to Putting the Pieces Back Together with John Galena and Brad Borders. Join us again next Tuesday at 8 a.m. and Saturday at 5 p.m. for Putting the Pieces Back Together on News Talk WSIC.